Hi, and welcome to the Electronics and Programming Beginner's Guide. Today I want to talk about a project that I'm working on, and this is going to be the first video in a series uh, because I'm currently on Rev 3 of this project, but I wanted to document uh, what Rev 1 looks like. Uh, this project, I call it the Charge Minder, uh, comes from basically paranoia. So uh, everybody's got one of these lying around, cell phone charger, and I really hate uh, leaving my cell phone plugged in overnight. My cell phone battery will last me all day, and then at the end of the day, I'm at like 20%, 15%, something like that, and I uh, I know that the phone will die overnight. I won't have enough time to charge it the next day. And said, I really hate leaving the phone plugged in overnight. And one of the nice features of these modern chargers is that this is a USB cable. So the idea I came up with for the charge minder is to make something that goes in between the cable and the charger and allows me to do a timer that I could, uh, let's say, charge my phone for two hours and then after two hours, uh, the charging would shut off. And so the Charge Minder project was born. The reason for my paranoia is that uh, in mobile devices, it's really kind of a crapshoot whether the mobile device includes uh, battery management or not. The problem with that is that if you, let's say, leave a device that doesn't have any battery, battery management plugged in overnight, once the phone is, or once not just the phone, once any mobile device is fully charged, now you continuously charge the battery even though the battery is fully charged and you wear on the battery. Uh, some phones, particularly phones, uh, the, you can destroy a battery in like six months where the battery just won't hold the charge anymore because leaving it plugged in overnight wears on the battery so much faster than uh, uh, plugging it into charge and as soon as it finishes charging, unplugging it. Uh, some devices are particularly bad about this. Uh, Samsung for a long time uh, had issues with their uh, battery charging and, uh, and it was actually one of my friends found in the owner's manual for his phone that uh, in the section describing charging there's a single line that says when the phone is done charging unplug it meaning that uh, in so many words that the phone didn't uh, didn't have any kind of uh, charge management built in where it would actually shut off charging once the phone was fully charged. Now let's talk about something that I really really hate. Particularly from an engineering standpoint, uh, marketing requirements are a giant pain in the ass. What marketing requirements that I came up with for this charge minder is that it had to be small, it had to be cheap, it had to be easy to use, and finally that it could uh, time out one hour, two hours, or four hours. Uh, the reason for the, the first three marketing requirements are very self-explanatory. Uh, the reason for the one hour, two hours, or four hours is that I figured a small device could charge in an hour. Uh, my own personal phone uh, charges in about two hours, or at least it'll get up to about 90%, which uh, is perfectly fine. And I figured large devices like tablets, for instance, would charge in four hours. Now for things that are much more fun, which are the engineering requirements. And obviously the first engineering requirement is you have to be able to, tur uh, to turn charging on and off. Uh, the simplest solution for that is just to use a P-channel MOSFET, which is in line with the uh, five volt positive line of the uh, charger. So that whenever uh, you want to charge, you turn on the FET and power, the five volts will flow uh, through uh, the FET. And when you turn the FET off, charging is complete. Uh, to uh, work all of the electronics on the uh, on the board, on the charge minder, I decided to use a microcontroller. The microcontroller would turn the FET on and off and also uh, take in the inputs from all of the controls on the charge minder. And for the project, I chose a PIC 12F615. Uh, the part is very inexpensive, which goes towards the marketing requirement. You could get the part uh, very small. It comes in a TSOP, which is a tiny, tiny little package. Uh, and uh, the part uh, 
it can be easily programmed. Now let's talk about the inputs and outputs to the uh, microcontroller, which uh, come together to work the whole thing. Uh, as an output to uh, the end user, I decided to just use a single LED. Uh, my thought was that the LED would dim in and out for when the device was off and then it would flash uh, whenever the device was on uh, to really easily show you whether you're doing the one hour, two hour, four hour charge, the LED would flash once every two seconds for uh, one hour, twice every two seconds for uh, two hours, and four times every two seconds uh, for four hours. That way, when you turn it on, you can really easily see uh, whether you're in the one hour, two hour, or four hour modes. As inputs for the charge minder, uh, first of all, I use just a momentary contact push button, nice and simple. And then for the selection of one hour, two hours, or four hours, I use the slide switch. Uh, this is and a representation of what the slide switch looks like. And the idea behind the slide switch is this is a four contact slide switch and it has uh, three positions. And those three positions are going to be the one hour, two hours, or four hours. Uh, this is a representation of the contacts inside the slide switch and the contacts have a shorting bar that sits across them. The shorting bar looks like this. It Like that. <clears throat> the shorting bar is tied to the the little uh, piece on the switch that you actually you know use your finger to slide back and forth. So the idea is that if I take this common contact right here and I ground it, and then they put pull-ups on these two lines, I could get three different positions out of the switch. So when the switch is in the current position, uh, the uh, let's call this line number one. Uh, will be low. If I slide the switch over one, so now it's touching uh, two and three, line two will be low. And when I push the switch all the way to the left, now it'll be touching three and four, line four will be low. Technically, I really don't need line four for anything, so I can leave line four floating, but the uh, three different states would be if line one is low is one state, if line two is low is another state, and if both lines are high is a third state. The final piece of the puzzle, so to speak, is that I wanted a good timing for the chip that I could accurately do the one hour, two hour, four hour, so I decided to use a watch crystal. Uh, the watch crystal is very, very small because it's meant to go in a watch and it comes in the frequency of uh, 7.62 uh, kilohertz. The 7.62 kilohertz is a nice uh, number for binary because it's a two to the fifth power that it makes it really easy to count out uh, one second uh, using this frequency. This is a list of all of the inputs and outputs that I'm going to connect to the PIC12 F615. Uh, the uh, PIC12 F615 is only an 8 pin part and two of those pins are used for the power and ground so you have uh, six pins that are remaining. So let's just do a quick inventory of everything that we have here. Uh, controlling the FET, turning it on and off is gonna eat up one pin, like that. Uh, the crystal, the watch crystal, is a completely uh, integral part, meaning that it has all the capacitors and the drive circuit, etc. and all it does is it outputs a uh, clock signal. So uh, one clock signal input, that's one. Uh, the LED drive uh, is going to use a one pin. The button is going to use one pin. And as we talked about earlier, the slide switch uses two. So altogether, uh, all six pins of the processor are accounted for. Uh, next, I'm going to show you what the actual schematics for the uh, charge minder uh, version one look like. And I will post those schematics uh, on my website, so if you want to take a look, you're more than welcome to. 
I'm also going to uh, post the code that went into the first version of the charge minder but I'm not really going to support that version of code because I wasn't super duper happy with it. I did end up rewriting it, which is, it came out uh, far better. Uh, the, and I'll talk more about this when we take a look at the schematic. The biggest issue I had with getting, you know, it sounds really simple, six pins, six connections, but the problem was that on top of all of this, and actually I should probably write it in, I have to do a programming header. The programming header allows me to program the processor, but you have to be very careful with the programming header because you can't have any uh, capacitance on the programming lines. Uh, you can't have any drive signals on the programming lines. And like, for, ex for example, uh, putting the crystal onto one of the programming lines would be a big no-no. Or putting the LED on one of the programming lines would be a big no-no. So the, the uh, biggest time spent pretty much on the entire project is just moving pins around on the processor uh, to get both the programming header, which uh, if I haven't mentioned, takes three pins to do. Uh, these three pins have to overlay with these six to make sure that you can uh, program the processor. As I said, kind of playing musical pins with the pins took a really, very, really long time just so I could uh, program the processor while it was soldered into the project uh, without any issues. What you're looking at here is the schematic for my charge minder. Uh, I used to call it a charge timer, but eventually the name charge minder kind of popped up and stuck. So let's go over some of the basics. Uh, this is the interface with the input USB port that plugs into the charger and the output USB port that uh, the USB cord plugs into. The output plug is just a standard a USB plug, it's a through-hole component. Uh, this input USB plug, I actually found a library for the, uh, to make it out of a circuit board. The lines obviously go straight across uh, on the ground side, you have a couple of decoupling capacitors, and then this is the P-channel MOSFET that will break the line to the uh, USB cord to stop the device from charging. The MOSFET uses a 100K resistor to pull it up, the pull up the gate. That makes sure that the MOSFET is off by default. And then a 1K resistor goes to pin 3 on the, this is a PIC 12F615. And that 1K is there just to limit the inrush currents for the uh, gate capacitance. Uh, moved over here, we have, this is the watch crystal. The watch crystal requires its own uh, decoupling capacitor. This comes right out of the data sheet. And then the watch crystal is an, uh, all self-contained, and it just has a single line output to a clock source. This goes to pin 5, and if we look, I'm using a T0CKAI, and this is the clock input for timer 0. Uh, the button right here is very simple. You have a pull-up to this line right here, and then when you push the button, the button pulls the line down. I'm doing the debouncing for the button in software. The processor itself has a decoupling capacitor right here. And then over here we have the LED, which this goes to a... A PWM pin, which is P1A star. This is an alternate uh, location for the PWM. And then the switch that we talked about earlier has two pull-ups. And these go to pin 4 on the processor and pin 7 on the processor. Rearranging all of these pins, as I mentioned earlier, really took the longest because uh, pins such as uh, VPP or MCLR, which is the master clear line, and uh, ICSP DAT and ICSP clock 
uh, pin six and seven, pin four, uh, cannot have any kind of loading on them. Meaning that uh, a 10K pull-up is okay, but for example, an LED would pose too much loading, or if the line had the clock signal coming out of the crystal, that would also make it not work. So uh, I specifically chose these three lines to go to my uh, switch and to the button. The only thing to keep in mind is that the switch has to be all the way in the down position for you to be able to program the processor. And sometimes I forget and go, why won't it program? Oh yeah, I have to flip the switch and try it again. The way I'm programming the device is using these uh, test points, which I'll show you in uh, just a second. But these test points uh, line up with the standard pinout for the Picket 3. So it goes uh, VPP, VDD, VSS, ICSP, uh, DAT, and ICSP clock. The spacing on these test pads on the actual board ended up being just the perfect size, and mind you entirely accidentally, to solder on a ribbon cable to them, <clears throat> uh, to then go out to a 0.1 millimeter uh, header. So now that we've taken a look at the schematic, let's take a look at the board. Uh, this was the final board design. As I mentioned, the USB connector is part of the board, uh, the input one, and the output is just a standard uh, uh, through-hole USB connector. Uh, let me shut off the top layer so you can see it better. <clears throat> Those test pads that we talked about before, these are those test pads. And I said the alignment of those is just right for a ribbon cable. And I use the little letter V here to mark that this is pin 1, this is VPP. And that's really about it. Let me turn the top layer, top layer back on. <coughs> So uh, otherwise, there really isn't anything uh, special about this board. Um, let's take a look at what this board looks like uh, in reality. This is the final product that came out of uh, the board layout and the schematics I showed you. As you can tell, there is quite some, quite a bit of bodginess on here, some wires, etc particularly here on the back. And I will talk more about those uh, when we talk about version two, because I want to have nice continuity from, oh, this is what happened and this is how the problem was solved. But as you can see, you have the selector switch and you have the one hour, two hour, four hour. And then this is the button that turns it on and off. This is a board edge connector. And then this is the where the USB cable plugs in. And it's really quite that simple. Oh, uh, what I forgot to mention, <clears throat> or what I forgot to show you was that here, uh, this is the programming header that I was using. That if you look on the back here, right here are those pads. And if you look carefully, those pads line up really nicely with the ribbon cable, although this has been soldered on, so it looks kind of crappy right now. Those line up nicely and then you plug the uh, Picket 3 right into this point one header. Now now that we've taken a look at the what this looks like, uh, let me draw the curtain back a little bit and we can uh, take a look at how it functions. Alright, so I've got a charger here. And if I plug this guy in, it's kind of hard to see in the slide, but you can see the LED dimming in and out right there and this shows you that it's off so now i've got my cell phone right here we can go ahead and plug the cable in like that let me see if i can get a nice so now when i push the button it's set for two hours and there you go my phone detected that it's being charged and the way the software is written if i go ahead and throw the slide switch to let's say one hour 
you can see it's still flashing two hours. To get it to one hour, you have to turn it off. So now the LED dims in and out again. If you push the button again, you get a single flash. And there you go, my phone detected that it's being charged again. Thank you for watching. As I mentioned previously, I will post the Eagle files for the Sky uh, on my website. And I will also post the version one of the software that went into this guy. Although I can't say I'm super duper proud of the software. It's not commented super well, and it's kind of bodged together. The version two is far better. And I will post that whenever I post the uh, version, uh, version three video. Cause actually version two of the software into version three of the uh, charge minder. Uh, thank you for watching. Uh, if you have any questions, please comment in the comment section down below or send me an email.